the London School of and a BA in Urban Studies from Columbia University. She lives in Queens with her husband and twin son and daughter. It's my, del my delight to welcome Julia. Julia, take it away. Thank you, Anna. Um, thank you. It's um, also great to follow the sheriff because I've um, on the Vision Zero Task Force really enjoyed uh, working with the sheriff. You see an ice cream truck or a bus and they see all kinds of different layers of things going on and it's it's been incredibly enlightening. So um, it, it's, it's great to be following uh, Sheriff Fusio. So today I'm going to talk about um, New York City's speed camera program now in its eighth year and what we believe is the largest uh, urban speed camera program in the world. Um, it's also one of the cornerstones of Vision Zero in New York and one of the most recognizable of the public facing aspects of this really wide ranging program. Um, and unlike many of the uh, initiatives that my agency, the DOT, um, undertakes, like say building a bike lane or retiming a signal, um, running the speed camera program is unique because it takes authorization from the state legislature to allow us to do it. Um, that means, yes, of course, that the decisions are made for us several hundred miles away in Albany. Uh, state legislators from all over the state have a say in what happens in the streets of New York. And I think, in, in my opinion, the speed camera program has lasted so long and grown and thrived because we've been able to have this solid base of data that we use um, to base off our communications and to de demonstrate why the cameras are effective, fair, and reasonable. Um, and we've been able to humanize the numbers as well in order to show that this is a worthwhile initiative. And I'm going to explain how we translate this data heavy topic into a sustainable safety policy that gets that necessary buy-in from elected officials and the general public in order to change behavior. So um, I know I don't need to lecture a whole bunch of transportation experts on the importance of speed management, um, but I do want to talk a bit about the safe systems approach that undergirds Vision Zero. And there's three uh, main principles there. First of all, the humans make mistakes. We're not perfect. Um, but the road design should be forgiving of those errors, meaning that if you are behind the wheel of a vehicle or you're riding a bike or you're walking and you don't follow the rules for whatever reason, this consequence should not be a serious injury or a death. And then third, system designers are meant to take responsibility for how well that system works. And if something is going wrong, it means that you go back and you reevaluate and you look at your data and look at what's actually happening in the real world to try to tweak and refine it. Um, so while we still tell drivers that their choices matter and we talk about personal responsibility because driving a car is a tremendous personal responsibility, having the safe systems approach underpinning Vision Zero helps kind of move away from the landscape of, of assigning blame and more towards one in which we can enable drivers to make better decisions, or if they still you know, do not make a good decision, less serious consequences for their errors. And of course, um, you know, the average person getting our Vision Zero messages doesn't have a huge knowledge of physics, but we know that human body can only withstand so much harm. And if you're hit at a lower speed, the consequences are likely to be lesser. And likewise, um, the average member of the public you know, can't maybe do the calculations on lights, but we do know that if you're moving fast, it's going to be harder to stop. Uh, just how hard it is, is what we try to communicate and we put it into reliable context, like a block versus a block and a half on Queens Boulevard, as you see here. In 2014, one of the very first uh, major policy changes under Vision Zero was the change in the default speed limit from 30 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour. And interestingly enough, this one also took state action, even though it's something that only affects New York City. Um, and when we were trying to make, uh, not only to publicize this change so that as many people as possible would comply, but also to make it you know, politically palatable so that people would automatically get their you know, backs up and go, oh, it's just another way you're coming after our drivers. We talk about how the difference, a minor distance, difference in speed can mean a large change in stopping distance and also that what we were doing was essentially risking, or sorry, it was essentially halving the risk of pedestrian death. Small change in numbers, large change in your real world impact. So talking more about what our camera program looks like now, uh, we, are, we currently have cameras in 750 school speed zones. Uh, this is the maximum authorized by the state. Um, a school speed zone is defined as a quarter mile radius around the school building. We can put multiple cameras in those zones um, but all right now, 750 zones all have at least one in them, and many have several more. Uh, right now, I believe we're at about 1,300 and counting, and we're hoping to go up to about uh, 2,200 by next year. 
Uh, these cameras operate now from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. on weekdays year round, regardless of when school is in session. Um, and they snap a photo of the license plate if you're traveling more than 10 miles per hour above the posted limit. That uh, the consequence is a $50 fine that goes to the registered owner of the vehicle. Now, keep in mind, our cameras don't exactly see who's driving. Uh, I know that in some countries, you have extremely powerful uh, speed or red light cameras that can identify the individual. We're not doing that for a bunch of reasons. Um, but what we believe is that if you are the registered owner of a vehicle, you do have uh, a responsibility for making sure it's responsibly used. So that is the person to whom the, uh, the notice of violation is mailed. Uh, you don't get any points on your license for it, though, because again, we can't prove who was driving. And where we put these cameras is, site is determined solely by the data on the extent of speeding in a school zone, as well as the extent of uh, pedestrian killed and seriously injured crashes, which um, I'll say a little more in a little while about why relying on that kind of data has really helped uh, to keep our program running smoothly. So I, I always say that you know there's no one magic bullet for Vision Zero. If there was you know one thing that massively could just slash our death numbers, we would have you know put it in, and everywhere in the world would put it in. But when it comes to speed management, these cameras are really kind of as good as, as good as we get in terms of one single intervention. Speed management is probably our most important tool, and the speed cameras are the most efficient way that we're we're managing it. So um, as of our last report published uh, last year, speeding's fallen by about 72% at uh, the fixed camera locations. And uh, as a consequence, injuries are down 17%, and that's spread all across um, all modes. So there's a benefit to the drivers as well. Um, and then we're finding that these cameras, more importantly, are very effective in changing behavior. It's not just that we're collecting fines. It's that ideally, we want these cameras to you know, put themselves out of business. Um, and in the calendar year 2019, two thirds of these license plates that got one violation did not get a second within the year. Um, people got that one ticket. It was enough to kind of tell them, well, I'd really rather not fork out $50, but also enough to, you know, not be so harsh a penalty as to seem punitive or unfair. Um, and then we, um, after the state legislature allowed us to expand the number of locations we have and, exp and expand the hours of operation, we put in a lot more cameras uh, in the second half of 2019 and throughout 2020, even with the pandemic. And so the odds of any speeding driver getting caught by a camera increased. Uh, but even after that increase, still uh, over half of violators in the year 2020 did not get a second ticket after their first. And um, furthermore, speaking a bit more about just the efficiency and the fairness of this program from a more bureaucratic standpoint, we do give every registered owner the opportunity to challenge a ticket if they feel that what, for whatever reason it's incorrect or wrong. Uh, they can challenge it at um, the Office of Administrative Tribunals and Hearings, and very few do, less than 3%. Uh, and then of all violations, uh, about 1 in 1,000 gets overturned. So this is uh, that, that's a concern, very good rate for any kind of um, municipal ticket there. So um, people are, are accepting when they get the ticket, they know what they've done is wrong. They've got this online link to the picture we have with their camera. They accept it, they learn, and they move on. And this is what you want to see in, in a policy. You, you want to see it changing behavior and not just, you know, say, earning revenue. Because in the perfect world, we wouldn't have any speeding and we wouldn't have any revenue. So thinking a bit about how we got here, it wasn't just the data that got us here. And I want to you know, be very clear about that, even though we have fantastic data that you just saw on the effectiveness of this camera. As I said, we couldn't just do this unilaterally because it involves revenue collection. We needed the blessing of the state legislature. And New York City DOT has a really good relationship with the advocacy community here in New York. I came up out of it about uh, four years ago. And um, I specifically want to shout out to a group called Families for Safe Streets that you may know. And it's, you know, it's the club no one wants to join. Everyone involved has lost a friend or a family member in a crash. And many of them are now very strongly advocating for street safety measures. Uh, so what we found is that we could kind of combine our quantitative side of data here at NYC DOT with the more uh, personal qualitative aspect of um, advocacy because you know I could quote stats to an elected official all day and all night and they can be great stats but it won't have as much impact as one of their constituents saying like look this was my child this was my husband this was my friend 
and they died and they didn't need to, and something like this uh, speed camera program is proven to you know, spare somebody else the pain that I went through. Um, so it's, it's kind of a partnership in that regard when it comes to uh, the politics behind all this and putting pressure on lawmakers who may also be thinking, well, am I going to get you know, trouble in my next reelection bid if I've voted through this program? Um, you know, together kind of combining that qual and that quant side um, is, is what makes a, a policy and helps it you know, get through all the uh, legislative hurdles. So when we first began the speed camera program, we were only at 20 locations. It was 2014, this was a pilot program. Uh, we'd already had red light cameras in New York, but speed cameras were new. Uh, we were allowed to increase that to 140 locations in mid 2014. And we were very limited in terms of where the camera could be. It had to be on the street adjoining the school entrance. It could only be on from about an hour before to an hour after school activities. Um, and then like many programs, uh, authorized by state law, it had a natural sunset date, and that was four years later in 2018. Uh, the legislature, for all the horrible, frustrating reasons that politics entails, um, did not renew it in 2018. Um, we had to go through a whole bunch of kind of emergency orders, both the state and city level, to keep it up and running. But then a new legislature passed an extensive expansion in 2019 that got us where we are today. And to get to that point, to kind of Passed that bill, not only did we have you know, the work of the advocates, but we also had a plan here at the city level. How many zones would we need? How many zones? We, we came to the 750 number, both as something politicians would accept, but also something that we found, as you'll see in this photo here, if we had 750 zones, we feel we could have at least one camera in every place that had a significant speeding and pedestrian injury problem. Uh, we derived when we came to figure out, you know, what is a speeding problem, we use citywide telematics data, uh, which came from the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, who you'll be hearing from in the future session. They have telematics devices on all city vehicles that monitor in real time how fast someone's going. Um, so we put, we, and when you think about it with all the safe driving training that they also do and that we have within our agencies, if a city vehicle is speeding, it's safe to say there's a bigger speeding problem with the general public. So we took that data as well as pedestrian death and serious injury from the most recent years that we had, um, recognizing that there was likely to, you know, we that, you know, kind of when, when you combine the two, we can kind of make this systematic way in which we can go down the list and say, all right, here are, if we're evenly weighting them, this is where one camera is going to have the greatest public benefit. <clears throat> and there's really, I call it the inherent equitability of that because, the camera is seen not as a perk that you can get for, you know, saying you want it enough or not something that a politician can give their district, but it's also not a punishment. It's not something we're directing specifically toward certain neighborhoods just because, or we you know we would never want to, you know, punish anybody with it. Simply the camera, the first cameras go where the problem is the worst, where they can do the most benefit and where there's the greatest need. And then we move down the list systematically, and we still are. Um, so what we're seeing is that, of course, the changes in violations happened um, very quickly in the early years because we were putting them in the places that had the greatest need. And now as we move down the list, we're going to places where speeding was less of a problem to begin with. But also now people have gotten the deterrent effect from several years of a citywide program. So there's less speeding in the first place. Um, we know that where we put them, there's likely to be a lot of overlap with you know, the historic inequalities and injustices that we see in urban planning in America, because you know where did we put the public housing? We put it on these large super blocks with long straightaways, with long distances between stop signs or stoplights. And you know there, there is a national conversation going on now about you know is this targeting you know, poor communities of color? But what we see is that because we've kept the penalty a lot less than what it is for other kinds of uh, moving violations, and also people who live in these communities are most likely to be walking it's actually going some way to correct that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have data on who exactly is getting a ticket uh, because we can't identify the driver, but it's something that we're looking into uh, in the future. So 2020, you don't need me to remind you, was really a strange year. Um, we saw an increase in speeding on local roads because they were emptier. Um, our more risk averse dr drivers who tend to be older were staying home. And we had extremely worrisome increases in um, 
motor vehicle occupant and motorcyclist deaths. Pedestrians were actually our lowest ever on record in New York, but our motorcyclists doubled. Um, and when we looked at where these were happening, you know, trying to see what the data could show us, uh, we saw that 75% of our fatalities last year happened in places or at times when a speed camera could not operate. And this includes all our highway fatalities because we cannot have the cameras on highways or it happened during the hours of the day when we can't operate them or they happened on weekends. So uh, in addition, drilling down a little further, 35% of the non-highway fatalities happened within those school zones that do have cameras, but that's, it was at a time when the camera could not uh, operate uh, based on the state law. So um, another concerning thing we're looking at is, you know, what do we do about these hardcore recidivists, the people who are in that minority who don't get the message after one or two uh, violations? As you'll see here, even though you know 2% of violators getting 10 or more tickets in 2020, it's a small percentage, but it still is tens of thousands of people when you think about how many vehicles go through New York City. So this is also something that's kind of coming to the forefront here. And uh, the data is showing us that it's time to be, uh, look a little further into it. So um, a few years ago, we actually began a research collaboration with the University of Chicago uh, with their Energy and Environment Lab, because we were looking into do, does our camera data have any kind of predictive power? If we look at um, which vehicles are getting what kind of violation and how many, and then we look at um, who's getting into crashes, especially serious crashes, can we say that you know we could make any kind of linkage, maybe not causality, but some kind of linkage between getting automated enforcement tickets and being in a, a serious crash? So we actually found that our red light camera violations were more predictive than speed camera violations with regard to involvement in an injury crash. Uh, it doesn't mean that there was no predictive data from the speed cameras, but simply that if someone was going through red lights multiple times, um, they were more likely to eventually get into a crash than someone who'd uh, gotten multiple speed camera tickets. Both those still are indications of you know, scoff law behavior, of dangerous driving, of risk taking, and we're continuing to look into that data uh, to kind of see where it's going. But in the meantime, uh, the city council passed a local law 36 last year, uh, which is also called the Dangerous Vehicle Abatement Program. And it requires uh, DOT to create an educational course for uh, registered vehicle owners whose vehicles have excessive speed or red light camera violations. Um, we set the threshold lower for red light cameras than for speed cameras because of what this data from the University of Chicago told us about uh, the predictive power. Um, and if someone does not take this class after they're uh, told they need to, they could risk getting their car impounded by the sheriff, incidentally. Uh, so we are working now, we're currently in the uh, contracting process to work with um, a specialized provider to do a course that specifically talks about the dangers of speeding and, and the impacts that these crashes have on people's lives. And after uh, a few years of this program, DOT is required to report on, you know, did these classes work essentially? What did we see for recidivism? If we've got those people who are in that 10 plus column of the chart I showed you right here, uh, I, obviously we're not going to be able to get to 45,000 people taking a class, but from the people in this little universe of severe reoffenders who we have, um, how, how did this change their behavior compared to say those who didn't take it? Um, and how, how did certain behavior correlate with crashes? And then addressing those um, issues I was talking about in 2020 with 35% you know, of non-highway fatalities were in camera zones, just not when we could use them. There's currently a bill in the Senate and Assembly that would allow us to have 24 seven operations of the camera. And again, we, we have that 35% statistic from the 2020 data to show there's a definite need and that we, you know, we probably could cut a huge chunk of these deaths out of the stats if we were allowed to run these cameras overnight. Um, it would also allow for escalating fines, which is something I've been very interested in um, for a long time. You know, it's a $50 ticket now, regardless of whether it's your first or your 20th. Um, if we were to bump that up by say $50 each time, and then your registration gets suspended uh, after a certain number, would that have more of a deterrent effect? And if so, how much? And this would also allow for records to be shared with insurance companies. So again, we could possibly see if your insurance company is giving a sanction for repeated tickets, how does that change your behavior? So if I had to come up with kind of what's our you know, data-driven policy research for the rest of the speed camera program, it would be, um, you know, should that legislation pass, I have to give the caveat that the state legislative session ends tomorrow. And um, it's uh, it has not been brought up to a vote yet. So um, 
could happen, but possibly will not this year. However, next year, definitely, I, I hope. Um, I would want to know really what is that magic place in a fine amount that would change these hardcore reoffenders? What What is the tipping point? If $50 works for most people, we want to keep the first offense is $50. But then if we find, you know, 100, 200, 300 is the point where the reoffenders really start thinking, okay, this is no longer the cost of doing business that I want, what would that be? And what's the cost sensitivity of these drivers compared to the people lower down? But there's also something that we're looking at uh, because in Europe, uh, some countries are allowed to tie the amount of your speed camera fine to what your income is. Because you know, if you hit um, someone who's very rich, $50, they don't miss it. If you hit someone who's got a very low income, $50 is more of a pain. So if we, there, there are various reasons why we can't do a system like this, unfortunately. Um, but if you know in the future it was possible, um, what would be that that point? Where would we want to set it to really have the greatest impact um, on recidivists? We're also kind of curious if we could get 24/7 operation. What would be the profile of drivers who speed overnight compared to during the day? Um, again, we would only have the information on the vehicle owner, but would we see any patterns and say uh, where they live or? Uh, in age or in sex or anything like that. And then finally, if insurance companies did have the power to kind of hike up rates on people who keep getting speed camera tickets, would that have more of an impact than just a direct fine? Because insurance is something that you buy into and that stays with you and is tied to your name, whereas DMV records can feel kind of distant and, and impersonal. Um, so these are all things that, you know, with the uh, with further political, with further legislative action, we can perhaps devote some more research resources to. And then finally, um, when, when I go and I talk or, you know, around the country or to people elsewhere about speed camera programs and how they work, I, I try to stay away from the whole, oh, well, we're New York, it's special there. And New York exceptionalism is great in so many ways, but uh, not when it comes to wanting to share best practices. So I really say that any location, when you create a Vision Zero program and you make it data-driven, it's a clear mandate for action. You can talk about the impacts that traffic crashes are happening are having on your city and the way that certain behaviors are contributing to them. And when you keep data focused there, you, you make a very good argument for something quantitative like speed and how you can move the needle there. Um, you have to have those statistics that you can rattle off really quickly to make a point. I mean, communication, you can have great data, but if you don't communicate it properly, it's just sitting there doing nothing. So if you can say we're halving your risk of pedestrian death by dropping the speed limit five miles per hour, there you go. You've just made you know, a really good, concise um, argument to people who don't need to have any kind of specialist knowledge. Uh, but then you also need to humanize uh, your statistics to show that you know these are not just numbers on the page, they're your neighbors, they're your friends, and a good partnership with advocacy is essential for that and it helps create political momentum. And then continuing your communication and your outreach efforts throughout the lifespan of the program. Now here, eight years down the line, we still do a lot of communication on the speed cameras. Helps keep you know people thinking that you know it's fair, it's reasonable, it's not out to get you. It's only fifty dollars, whereas if you got caught by a cop, it would be points on your license and you know possibly three-digit penalties. Um, it helps these cameras just kind of become more and more accepted, which they are now, fortunately, we found out from polling. And then finally, keeping uh, an eye on your data and seeing where it goes helps you to kind of tweak that program um, and to, to make it more um, effective. So for example, when we want to think what went wrong in 2020 and we find out about all the crashes that are happening in our zones where we can't use the cameras, we now have a very specific legislative ask and we have something to work for uh until specifically look at. great and then finally you know policy i say needs data data can't be everything and this is why even though we were very proud of the speed camera program and we make it a centerpiece of the program i like to say that um you know it, it's not the only thing we have going on like for example um working with the vision zero task force uh the taxi and limousine commission say goes and communicates with the tens of thousands of drivers the licenses to ensure that they understand this, uh, the speed limit, to ensure they understand the traffic laws. Um, we have this whole program where we have, you know, the Business Integrity Commission doing outreach to private sanitation trucks. We have city administrative services talking to city fleet drivers, of whom which there are, you know, tens of thousands. 
you have to have a multifaceted approach that really comes at a problem from multiple angles. That's why we keep the emphasis on saying that Vision Zero is about engineering, enforcement, and education, because all these things have to work together. Um, it's also why it's not just the DOT working here. It's a wide range of city agencies who make uh, things like our speed cameras relevant to, to everybody in the city. And it's also um, part, it's just one component of many different projects that we do throughout the year and many different legislative solutions that we uh, pursue. Because again, if there was one thing that worked, it would be, we'd be going full guns on it. But until then, we have a very wide tent and um, we, we have, you know, a, a very wide remit. But um, we can make speed cameras a visible cornerstone of Vision Zero so that people associate with it and keep speed management in mind. So uh, thank you very much for attending and I'm happy to answer any questions. If you think of one later, please feel free to email me. Thanks. Thank you, Julia. Um, we can open the, the chat is open if anyone has questions in the chat. Oh, and I see we have a hand raised. Um, let's start with uh, Paul. Uh, you wanna start with your question? Sure, yeah, thanks so much, Julia. It's a great uh, presentation. Um, I'm with the mayor's office of the CTO, and we recently published the uh, NYC IoT strategy, and we referenced the speed in, in uh, traffic uh, and the uh, red light cameras as a great use of connected technology within the city. I'm curious with the expansion of some of this automated enforcement with the MTA bus uh, lane uh, program, if there's any conversations around additional types of automated enforcement that DOT could be doing. I know that there was a um, there was a council bill about um, you know letting residents report like placard abuse or bike lane um, uh, you know bike lane blockages. Is there any conversations about using um, automated enforcement for those types of infractions as well? Bike lane enforcement is actually something that we're working on. Uh, it would not be the traditional kind of pole mounted. A camera there, but it would rather be cameras on the front of vehicles, which could drive by and snap the photograph of the plate that was parked in the bike lane. So um, it's a newer technology, but, but I know it's definitely something that we're uh, looking at. Um, and then we also we keep we we really like the idea of automated enforcement in general because um, even though you know NYPD is of course a really valuable partner in Vision Zero, a camera can always get more people than. Um, a single officer can. And also we know that the cameras, you know, politically they're very popular. Um, so we're looking into what other new technologies are, but um, I will say that our bus lane enforcement program does already use the escalating fines that I talked about. And uh, we're going to be keeping an eye on that to kind of see if there's any lessons the data can show us about recidivism that could eventually play into uh, how decisions are made about the uh, fine structure for the speed cameras. Great, um, thank you. Yeah, I might follow up about the uh, that new program. Definitely, thanks, uh, Philip. And then Sean. Hi, Julia. It's Philip Mantikowski from Transportation Alternatives. Um, I was curious if there's any discussions or concerns or movement in regards to um, apps warning drivers about upcoming cameras. Um, I don't know if it's a legal challenge or some other issue and um if that's if that's something that could be done and what that would look like um you mean like for us to make apps not warn people or to make apps warn people yes so currently apps are some of the apps are warning folks that there are speed cameras to so to prevent that um because there have been a few times where i'm in a car and the driver is speeding and they get a warning and they slow down just camera um, and then speed off past the camera. Well, yeah, we know that um, Waze has been, you know, is pretty probably the most common one and that uh, you know, Google as well is there. And our view really on publicizing where the cameras are is that at this point, now that we're in 750 zones, um, we're, we're not terribly resistant to people knowing where the cameras are. They're never supposed to be secret. Um, because, you know, if you know what a camera looks like, you then start seeing them everywhere. And our opinion is that if it slows people down, it's worth it because they'll get into the habits of eventually slowing down, maybe not just at those locations, but elsewhere. Um, and also, we, we want to remind people we still have 40 mobile units going around the city, and those change position 
pretty much every day. So even if a camera doesn't show up on your app, uh, because no one's taken the time to mark it yet, it still could be watching you. And I think as people get those mobile tickets, they'll realize like, oh, well, we've got that going on as well. Um, yeah, I mean, for the first time, I, I know I showed a share the photo within my presentation that had little circles around where each zone is. And we shared that this was really the first time that we ever shared the locations, because at first we wanted to, you know, maybe not publicize it so that people would just think, well, it could be anywhere. But now that we have so many, I think, you know, we do have something to gain from being more transparent in terms of, uh, you know, public opinion where we're just emphasizing like, no, it's not a gotcha. We have these locations because it's where the speeding's happening and because they're near schools and you need to slow down. So um, we're not really going to, we're not interested in pursuing, you know, telling anybody to not talk about it. I mean, more people talk about the cameras, I think really the better. Julia, we're about to get kicked out of our breakout room if we have just huh. a quick second for Sean's question. I don't know if it's a pass. Uh, yeah, just real quick. Um, is there a discussion to expand the cameras to the highways uh, instead of just something, something that we are talking about? Definitely, after those statistics from last year showed uh, what the extent was, it is something that we'd have to you know work with the state on, and something that we're not sure if we'll be able to get. But it's definitely you know on our kind of list of, of things that we want to want to pursue. Thank you. I wish we could talk about this for about at least an hour longer. Um, we're going to wrap it up here. And um, like Julia said, if you have any more questions for her, you can email her. Also, with our meeting follow up, you'll get everyone's contact information. Thank you, everyone. You can um, go to your next breakout session, either session C, fleet safety, or session D, driving in New York.